Hey guys and welcome back to part 2 of my AMD 486DX4100 video. Lots of stuff to cover including installing a sound card, networking card, CD-ROM interface card and drive. I also want to give you guys a quick overview of the BIOS on this computer just to see how these kind of settings can impact the overall performance of the system. So I'll be showing you a couple of benchmarks and the corresponding results. I'm not going to go too much in depth into all of this stuff, just going to look at some BIOS settings and see how we can optimize our little system here. I don't have a ton of CPUs to compare it against, so there's not really a point in that. But if you are interested in that type of stuff, I highly recommend you taking a look at the CPU Galaxy channel. So not only does this guy have the most amazing CPU collection, which is showcased on his channel from time to time, he also has a bunch of interesting videos. And one video in particular might be to interest of you, and that is his DX4100 comparison. So what he basically did is he took a whole bunch of uh, DX4 100 megahertz CPU, you know, Intel, Cyrix, uh, AMD, and did a whole bunch of benchmarks uh, against them and shared the results uh, in this video. So uh, I highly recommend checking out his video, checking out his channel. Just make sure you come back afterwards here to finish this video. No, I'm just kidding. Am I? I don't know. Another thing I'm not going to be doing in this video is to do an elaborate comparison of these PCI video card options that I had. I ended up going with an S3 Verge on this particular machine, but obviously there's a huge collection of PCI cards that you might end up putting in a system like this. I mean, it would be very time consuming for me to go through all of them and do the benchmarks, especially when I know a guy who already did just that. And that is PC Retro Tech on YouTube. So he has a whole bunch of cool retro videos, but one video in particular might be of interest if you're into you know, PCI graphics performance. And that's a comparison that he did of a whole bunch of PCI cards and stacked them against a whole bunch of Visa Local Bus cards. And even in another video, he did the same thing comparing ISA cards with Visa Local Bus cards. So yeah, lots of interesting information, lots of benchmarking data on those videos. So I highly recommend you checking out his channel PC Retro Tech on YouTube. But for now, in this video, we're going to be looking at some games. And in order to play games, you need sound. And in order to have sound, you need a sound card. And for that, I have this beautiful Creative Vibra 16 Sound Blaster 16, the CT202060. And this one has the Yamaha OPL chip on board. So that's pretty nice. So let's go ahead and install it in a free 16-bit ISA slot and we should be good to go. Now the Sound Blaster card is really nice because it has excellent support in lots of games. Basically you either have an option to select the Sound Blaster or it can de detect it automatically and you should be up and running really quickly. I mean you don't even need to install drivers in most cases so this thing will simply work. So that's pretty nice. We're on our way. So at the heart we have this Vibra 16 chip from 1994 and you actually configure the sound card using these jumpers. And these jumpers can be a little bit confusing at first, but I found a nice overview here at Phil's Computers Lab website. Highly recommend you checking him out. And here you can see how to set stuff like IRQ, low DMA, high DMA, uh, IDE port stuff, so lots of information there. But again, this is before plug and play or jumperless uh, cards were in the picture. So you needed to specify everything using these jumpers. Now creative driver support both for MS-DOS and Windows 3.11 was excellent. So all you need to do is launch the setup application from the driver disk. You do need to know the base I.O. address, MIDI port, IRQ and both DMA settings, but then it will just copy some files. It will automatically update your autoexec.bat and config.sys. It will install some Windows files so you have Sound Blaster support in Windows as well, providing you have installed Windows, obviously. And that should get you up and running very fast. 
and a quick reboot of the system will indeed confirm that it has found the Sound Blaster and the corresponding I.O. addresses, IRQs and DMAs. And for those thinking you have to wait till 1996 or 1997 to play some excellent MS-DOS games, we have got you covered here because just look at this uh, quarantine game for example, which is kind of reminds me a lot of Carmageddon. And no, this is not Duke Nukem 3D, but this is Shadow Warrior, an excellent first-person shooter from 1997 that actually runs pretty well on this machine. How about slaying a couple of zombies with Uzis on a Saturday afternoon? Death Rally is also a really nice game. I really like the menu of this game. It looks really far ahead of its time. The actual gameplay itself is relatively simple where you're just, you know, cruising along on a top level uh, map uh, trying to win the race where you can shoot each other, you have lots of upgrades, ammos, prize money to win. So yeah, really nice little game here. And if you want to see a glimpse of the future, at least the future being 2009, perceived by people who developed this game in 1997, you gotta check out this game here, Abuse. Nice little platformer that combines both the keyboard and a mouse. But one of the great revelations in my search for these 1995-1996 based MS-DOS games was this game called Z. I mean, this is a really nice real-time strategy game. I think it, it's like far ahead of its time because it's kind of a command and conqueror clone, but it has a really nice touch to it. It has high resolution graphics and it runs really great on this 486. Highly recommended game, definitely check it out. Another classic as far as I'm concerned. I'm Major from the Paris. This is NASCAR Racing. The iconic intro. Uh, the fact that you had this kind of low resolution version and a high resolution version that nobody could play back in the day because they didn't have sufficient computing power to run it. So yeah, this is racing simulation at its best, uh, especially in, you know, back in the day. Yeah, really fond memories of this game. And here you have the high res version. I mean, if you were able to tweak some of the graphical settings, it could, you could pull it off on a system like this. So yeah, really, really nice. Now, Micro Pro's Grand Prix 2 cannot be absent from this little list here. It's a game I actually loved back in the day. I mean, it had the actual drivers from then. It, uh, from a graphical point of view, this was really mind-boggling back in the day. You could, you know, turn on and off the driving aids. It was, uh, was pretty realistic, at least, you know, back in the day. So I'm just gonna try and hit that you know, first chicane here at Monza without screwing up, which is not that easy. I mean, especially not if you turn off all of the, the driving aids. So yeah, no traction control, no ABS. This is just pure, pure racing. And it runs really, really great on this AMD. And so does this one. Screamer, also a game more arcade stylish. I, I loved the, the graphics back in the day. It kind of looks a little bit dated now when you look at it. But yeah, a really nice game from 1995, fits this system perfectly, runs really well. It had this uh, low resolution version, which is a version that I'm running here, and also a high res version, which was virtually impossible to play on a 486. I mean, you can already see here that the low resolution one is kind of struggling from time to time, but it's definitely playable. So yeah, really nice, nice game. Now I've also added a networking card to this computer, but I've decided to not show this footage here. I'm going to create a separate video on this, which should drop very soon because I have all of the footage. So stay tuned for that. Now another card I'll be adding here is the Philips CD-ROM interface card, the CM260. So this is a proprietary interface card that was needed in order to run the double speed CD-ROM drive from Philips. So we're going to hook this up. Comes with this special cable that you need to use to hook up the actual CD-ROM drive. And I couldn't find a better excuse to run this Microsoft Auto Route Express Europe. This was part of the Microsoft Home Collection. You know, they had a bunch of software to kind of showcase the multimedia capabilities of Windows. 
So yeah, nowadays we've grown so accustomed to online services like Google Maps that just give you like instant information, which is very useful. Before, I mean, you needed to get out and, and buy yourself a CD-ROM like this, which uh, was pretty mind-boggling back in the day that it fit a whole map of Europe, including all of the routes uh, on a single disk. And I thought it would be fun just to show you what the experience was of, of running like a Google Maps kind of thing in 1996-1997. So time to open up the Philips double speed CD-ROM drive, insert our Microsoft Auto Route Express Europe and start the installation process. I mean this has this typical Windows for workgroups Windows 95 style installer so you just enter some information, hit next a couple of times, and the thing will be installed without any issues. And I have to admit, I was a bit surprised that the Philips didn't have any issues reading this CD-ROM. So it was just, you know, copying files onto the hard drive. I did notice that the LED was a little bit, you know, off-center here. I think it should be, you know, right up the eject button here, but yeah, minor issue. But yeah, it had no issues copying the files uh, to the hard drive. And with that out of the way, we were able to launch the Auto Root Express. We see the famous splash screen here. And we get this nice little map from Europe. And we can do stuff like zoom in and, you know, search for cities and, and just look at the amazing details of the map. Now, obviously, this looks horribly dated now, but I mean, at the time, it was just fun to click around and zoom in and see if you recognized certain roads. This CD-ROM also had a multimedia aspect to it because it contained pictures and backstories of the city. So, yeah, it also had this kind of encyclopedia effect to it. But at its core, this was all about creating routes. And with a simple eight step wizard, you were able to get from point A to point B. All you had to do is enter a destination, specify if you wanted to have stops along the way, select the features that you wanted to display, and you could only choose three out of five, specify your start and end time, some additional metrics, speeds, and then it would start calculating the route for you. And after it was done number crunching, you got this nice little overview both on the map and in text on how your route was supposed to be. So I also wanted to show you guys the BIOS on this thing. So this is a pretty standard award BIOS. I'm just gonna load up the setup default so you can see how it's set up you know, from the factory. And let's go into this section here. The only point of interest here is the boot up system speed. And I had to set this too low in order for the turbo button to work. If I set this too high, it will always be high. In the chipset features, you can see that the auto config is enabled. So you cannot change the write cycles, read cycles. You can disable the auto config and then you can play around with it a little bit. I'm just going to leave it at default for now. Uh, these refreshes and burst writes are disabled. Now this is a system with power management features, so it can turn off the hard drive, go into standby mode, and it can wake up on certain activities like uh, serial or parallel port access, stuff like that. The PCI IDE configuration allows you to, you know, configure the IDE channels and other stuff. But for now we're going to go with the defaults and we're going to run a simple benchmark just to show you guys how the various BIOS settings will impact your overall performance. So I'm going to run uh, this uh, Superscape benchmark here and at the end we will get a number, frames per second, which should give us an indication of the overall performance. And with the default settings we get to about 49.7. Now this is a pretty low score for a DX4100, especially with a PCI card. So we're expecting somewhere around the 60 frames per second. So let's enter the BIOS once more and see what we can tweak. Now, obviously, if we go into the chipset features, we can disable the auto config and we can play around with these write cycles, read cycles. So I'm just going to put everything to, uh, you know, the highest setting, meaning, meaning the lowest value. So that, that will 
and theory gives us uh, the the highest throughput and the best performance so i'm going to put everything uh, on the optimal settings and then see if the system will boot and run the benchmark again so here we have the benchmark running again so let's see what kind of score we will have now so we're at 51.3 which is marginally better than the previous score which was around 49 so we're again in the BIOS and this time we're going to go into the PCI IDE configuration. And what we'll do here is we're going to be enabling the CPU PCI memory post write buffer and the PCI master burst read write. Now because we have a PCI video card in the system, I am expecting this to give a serious performance boost. So let's check it out. So with the benchmark running again, let's see what the final score will be. And we are already at 57.9. Now remember, we're coming from 49-ish. So that's definitely a big step up. And that's the thing with these types of computers. I mean, messing around with the BIOS settings can either give you high performance gains, or if you mess up the settings completely, it can really boggle down your system, uh, grind it to a halt, and really give bad uh, benchmarking results, which will ultimately also lead to you know, gameplay, which is suboptimal. So with the settings I've just configured here, which are actually the slowest settings, if I reboot the computer now and execute the exact same benchmark, you will see a totally different result. So 45.3 frames per second. So remember the maximum we got out of it was around 58. And that pretty much wraps it up for part two. In the final installment of this series, we'll be looking at some various networking options, looking at the hardware, the software that is involved in configuring these networking cards in both an MS-DOS environment, as well as in a Windows for Workgroups environment. In the meantime, I'm going to be enjoying this machine a little bit and playing some games. So I hope you've enjoyed this series so far. Please let me know in the comments. Please consider subscribing. And I hope to see you guys soon. Bye-bye.